flourish. I don't normally need a mic, but uh, <laughs> we're all good. I'm glad we got the memo. There are splash zones here because the first three rows will be getting wet. Um, and just a disclaimer right up front, I'm, I'm unusually attracted to people doing email when I'm talking. So if I tend to gravitate around the room, it's, it's a thing. The doctor doesn't know what to do with me. Um, so yeah, my name's David Langley. I'm the Director of Enterprise Engineering with Commvault. I manage the western half of the US in the enterprise space. So I get to go to beautiful places and talk to smart people about avoiding risk and making money. Um, so when I, just to, before the polling slides come up, uh, anybody have any idea what Commvault does? Just shout it out. What does Commvault do? Thank you, backup. I'm not going to talk about backup. Because uh, frankly, I don't do it. Um, it's a waste of money. I, I don't see why people invest in it. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense. It's just a big time and resource suck. So I, I just don't see why. Um, what I am very interested in is what, is what the people who go out and talk to businesses about what they care about when it comes to IT, I'm very interested in talking about that. And what they're, what they're telling us and the people who are higher up the food chain than me is that the conversations are, are changing quite a bit. So they're talking about cloud and complexity. Here are my cheat notes, just so you know, when I walk by. Uh, cloud, and that's, I don't see cloud as what do we do with the cloud, but are we missing an opportunity to use a resource we haven't used before? Are we spending more money where we shouldn't? So that's a, that's a cost conversation in my book. Uh, complexity and speed, risk, right? Are we making our environment so complicated we can't manage it? All right, what about uh, modernizing legacy systems, right? We have to get up with the times. We have to take a, advantage of these amazing technologies coming from NetApp and these uh, hyper-converged infrastructures. How can they make our, my life more easy? Do you see the same trends I do? Risk, cost, ease, I mean, it's the same thing. And then when we talk about anywhere workers, particularly here in California, but nationally, how can you possibly attract the best possible talent if you're gonna tie them to a cube? Right? That gets harder and harder. Our end users, the quality talent we want to make our businesses successful, demand an IT experience that they didn't demand three years ago. Right? And then finally, big data. And just like cloud, I don't even know what it means. But when I say that, I'm talking about maybe data that people didn't make. I'm talking about machines, geodata. So, and, we, and the trick there is, I've got it. Is there any value in it? Do I need to keep it? What, what do I do with that? Right? So my, my biggest problem is, I work for Commvault, and when I talk to people about what Commvault does, they say, where's my guy? Backup. <laughs> it's not on the slide. I'm in trouble. All right? Well, actually, backup's super important. Well, I should say restores are super important. Um, but they don't avoid risk, and they don't make a business money. So let's talk about what, what we're backing up. Right? Why do we care? I mean, in the 80s, they, talked, they, they grouped all companies' resources into it being either something physical, something financial, or a human resource. Uh, and these are all expensive, particularly the human ones. But the question is, is your data an asset to your business? Does it make you better at what you do as a business? I'm checking for email. Um, and the interesting thing about data is uh, AWS, uh, I'm sure you've heard of them. They're, they're a little company out west. Uh, they're projected to be a $6 billion business by the end of this calendar year. Anybody want to take a stab at out of that $6 billion worth of transactions, what percentage of that ever touches a human being on the AWS side in terms of getting that transaction to happen? 10%. That's amazing. A company's making $6 billion, and a human being only touches 10% of that. There's a company that's made data an asset. Fascinating. Well, here's the next question, though. And do we know anything about our data? Right? I, I manage uh, people who manage engineers. And the hardest question they go and talk to a prospect about is, how much data do you have? And it's not a trick question. How much data do you have? I'm not talking about how much storage do you own. I'm not talking about how big is your cloud. I, I want to know how much actual data do you have that's providing value back to your business? Do you know? 
And, you know, I, I also have the pleasure of talking to some of the largest MSPs on the planet, and they know, but they generally have uh, you know, casts of thousands and spreadsheets to keep track of it all. But in the enterprise and even largest of large companies, they just don't know. The tool doesn't exist. They can tell me how big a VMware farm is. They can tell me how big their SAP infrastructure is, but they can't tell me, David Langley, we have 1.2 terabytes or petabytes as of this morning. How in the world can we make budgeting decisions? How can we decide what value our data has or where it's coming from or what kind of storage we need to buy or whether we even need to keep it if we don't even know how much we have, let alone who made it, where it came from, its business impact? So why do we put up with paying for tools that are time sucks, cost a lot of money, and don't make us better at what we do as a business? And what I'm here to talk about is stopping that. Let's make an investment. Oh, here's my polling question. Do you know how much data you have? Wow, that was a lead. It's like I planned it. That was awesome. Um, I'm supposed to talk here for a little bit. Uh, and again, I've never had anybody say yes with any conviction. I've been doing eight and a half years. There we go. Here's my educated guess. And that's fair, right? The, the best part about working in IT is I get to talk to people who really, really want to do a good job. In fact, they're so passionate about doing a good job, they go home on the weekends and they do IT in their basements just because they think it's fun. That's how much the people I get to talk to like doing what they do, and they, are, and they can't do it if they don't have the answers. So let's talk a little bit about this. And don't look at this as a bad to good kind of curve or, or timeline, but think about it as value. Yes, we have to protect our data. Things go bump in the night. It makes a lot of sense. But the question is, are we providing the right amount of access? For those remote workers, can they get to their data? If I don't have my laptop available, do I have a copy of my presentation available on my phone so I can review it before I walk in and talk in front of 100 people? Am I providing as diverse an access so that I'm getting the most value out of the data? And then let's talk about compliance. Not necessarily uh, legal compliance, and that's extremely important, but if you're a budget owner at a company, how can you comply with the SLAs and the standards that the people you report to are demanding? If I spend a million dollars on NetApp this month, is that, is that a real estimate? Does that track to my real growth? Or is that an educated guess? And then finally, share. And you know, Dropbox, and there's all sorts of wonderful tools to share out data. But am I introducing more risk in providing this ability than I am solving? Right, it's sharing data in a meaningful way is extremely powerful. Wouldn't it be great if I could share it but not take the risk of putting potentially intellectual property in the hands of somebody I don't even know? Or worse yet, don't provide the service. So the black ops IT, aka pretty much anyone who knows how to get to box.com, opens up their own account and is now sharing their data without anybody knowing. The phantom IT. And again, from, from a combo perspective, I'm not suggesting that we rip everything we have out. But let's initially start by finding tactical plays where we can save some money, reduce some risk, or uh, potentially even make some money with the data. We've got a large architectural firm based in Denver, uh, my current hometown. And they're based in 110 countries. And I was out to lunch with the CTO, again, smart guy. And I said, Craig, if I, if I could answer any question about your data, all of it, not just what was in a database, not just what was in SharePoint, what wasn't just in the files. If you could ask all your data one question, that would change how your business does what your business does. What would it be? Straight face, didn't even think about it. He said, I'd like to know who works for me. <laughs> I'm like, don't you have HR? I mean, come on, that's, that, you gotta give me something, right? It's like, no, the funny thing is, in the architectural space, we don't grow organically. We're, we're like a bank. If we want a certain technology or a certain geography, we just go and buy a smaller architectural firm. They're everywhere. So we're very, uh, we're, we grow through acquisition. It's all about M&A. I'm like, I'm still not there. He's like, well, I'm going to build a bridge in Europe using this technology. And he rattled off a term I'll never be able to repeat. And he says, I am going to use this technology, and over the next Five to 40 years, talk about a timeline. Five to 40 years, we're going to build state-of-the-art bridge using that particular technology. The problem is, halfway through that project, after I've done all the R&D and developed my IP, I'm going to get a bid offer in Africa, and I'm going to go with a brand new team 
and literally reinvent the bridge. Because I didn't even know this project was going on in Europe, let alone the fact that they were using that technology. So if I could ask all my data one question, I would be able to type in that technology and pull up all the white papers and all the design work we've done with that technology. Not because I want to read about the technology, I want to know about the author. So that every time I go to bid anywhere on the planet, I've always got the dream team as of my corporate assets that morning. And then I'm going to underbid everybody because I'm going to be able to cut timelines, save crazy amounts of money, and further the technology that I just designed. Like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. You want to know who works for you, but more importantly, what they're expert at in real time. There's no HR team on the planet that can do that. There isn't a CRM, there isn't a data warehouse that can keep track of all that unless you've got a thousand archivists running around and nobody has that. And so that's exactly what we did for him. We collected all of his assets, we run a content scan, scan across the entire planet, and he pulls up a Google interface, types in the technology, and it shows him all the documents that involve that technology. So he can find his authors that morning. Or probably not so much him, but all the, the bidding artists that he employs as well as all his project managers. And that's an opportunity to make data, make me better at what I do. And potentially the world, I mean most architectural firms are huge philanthropic industries. It, we're, we're changing the world just by using data better and smarter. So this is what we do. And I, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about we. This is what we do. We may not do all the bullets, right? But these are the services we employ, something, something's very tactical, expensive time suck, <laughs> and something's very functional and value-driven, such as sharing data, per preventing risk with legal e-discovery. All these bullets are things that we have to do. The problem is, this is how, oh, I'm gonna, oh, it's not gonna work. The problem is, it takes us that many bullets worth of tools to get the job done, and it's very expensive to do it that way. And I'm actually making more problems by introducing complexity and frankly, a lot of money and a lot of space to get all that done. More to come on that. But this is how Commvault addresses it. I'm trying to, is there a little laser pointer on this? No. Um, I'm trying to get to the point where I'm trying to connect all your assets, whether they're physical or in the cloud or somewhere in between, and provide these very basic high-level services. How do I connect all that? And what Commvault's really focused on doing, backup is much like my iPhone, uh, yeah, it's a phone, but that's not why it's the most important business tool in my kit. It's because it collects all the information from a variety of resources and allows me to repurpose it to another thing. Right? So if Adam sends me an invite to speak to you in California in an invitation and I click on the invitation, it shows me where I need to be and when. Right? But also, if I click on his name, it pulls up an email and allows me to contact him directly. And when I tap on the address, it pulls up a GPS and it shows me how to get there. It takes information I collect and makes it, makes it smarter. Well, what I'm suggesting we do is when we collect our data to protect it, let's index it in a much more meaningful way so that we can provide orchestration around what is it? What purpose does it have? How hot is it? And I want to standardize it in a way so I know why I'm rolling it out, where it's coming from, what business value it provides. And I'm going to put all this data in one repository. I don't have a TomTom -tom in my bag. I don't have a handspring in my bag. I don't have the hundred other, I don't have a Candy Crush game in my bag, right? I've got my iPhone that I play Candy Crush on. Uh, and I put it, it's all in one repository. And that's, that's the value, is that it's in one place. And through aggressive indexing, appropriate orchestration, and one repository, I save money and I empower myself to make more value out of the data that I already have. And this is how the industry, historically, has approached the problem. Why in the world would I make a company that provides solutions to me, their acquisition strategy, my deployment nightmare? And even if, even if, through some miracle of science, any one of these wonderful companies, wonderful companies, they do what they say they do, uh, with these wonderful companies, even if they had a sea of developers for 10 years, could they integrate all these solutions into one so that it went into one interface, and you got all the value of all these different tools from that one repository in a meaningful way. I just don't think it's possible. And then there's point solutions out there as well. Well, now I don't even have one vendor, so there's absolutely no hope. I've given up 
on the concept of actually collecting the data one time under the guise of protection and maybe being able to search it or provide e-discovery services against it or archive against it. And it's not just about software. Let's not kid ourselves. We're not here because we haven't found the right software or the right piece of hardware, right? It's all about making the solution work in a meaningful way. And so through consulting services, especially from Red 8, a phenomenal partner to Convault, has wonderful staff, but none of us walk alone, right? It's with Red 8 and Convault that we provide a uh, consulting angle to this. So it starts with, yes, deciding the right software solution, but then it comes into what's the right way to deploy it so you save money and you get the most value out of it. And then in terms of deploying it properly, and then at the end of it, putting a consultant on site, who I, I call it weaponizing, but essentially sits shoulder to shoulder with you and tunes it so that it fits your culture. Because we don't have enough pre-sale cycles to design it perfectly to your culture in the pre-sales process. We do that with professional operations consultants after the fact. And then I'll touch on support in a moment. 97% uh, customer satisfaction rate. I like the number, I don't like the number. We cheated. When you call Convault, the guy who picks up the phone only has to know one product. When you look at the competitive landscape, I couldn't even guess how many that person has to know. The other side of it is, we're the only product in the world in our space where our solutions call home. You know, a really cool thing about NetApp is it's always talking back to NetApp, and it's trying to get ahead of the problem before it happens, and getting the parts on site before you even notice, right? That's a huge value. That's proactive support. Our solution does the same thing. In fact, as we collect more information about your environment, we actually measure who's doing the best job. What did they change? Why are they faster than everyone else? And then we reach out to them, and in real time, we update our best practices so we can tell you that, hey, you don't have to change anything, but if you make this tweak, we suspect you could get this much more out of it, and we collect that data in real time because we get value out of the data. And partnerships, obviously, NetApp again and again and again. It's not so much, yeah, we're talking to NetApp, and yeah, we have integration points, and we have this big hug about we support one another, but how do we help you get the most out of what NetApp's bringing to the table? Right, very robust snapshot engine but maybe you don't want to manage the snapshot engine in a different interface than you're managing all the other data protection schemes you do. Why not have it completely orchestrated with no scripting in one interface so you see your backups and your archives and your snapshots all in one place so when you need to access something, you only have to go to one place. And then from a service provider perspective, you certainly don't generate your own power, you don't provide your own telephone service, and you don't take your own trash to the dump. Unless you're in the data management business, I don't necessarily think you have to be managing your data management practice. So we work with a lot of partners on providing managed services so you manage as much or as little as you feel appropriate so that you have to avoid the risk you need, but also don't spend the cycles on things that don't make you better at what you do. So yeah, conversations have changed. Fundamentally, in terms of the tools we're talking about, such as cloud, such as integrated, such as uh, hyper-converged infrastructure, and, and these are all technologies, but fundamentally, it's how do I make money, how do I reduce my spend, right, and how do I avoid risk? And backup is in there somewhere, by all means, but so is archive and replication and e-discovery and search. And wouldn't it be cool that if your product managers or, or development teams that decide where your business should go could actually ask all your data one question that would make you better at a, as a business, but you did it at a lower budget than what you're spending on backup, which I don't even know if it qualifies as an insurance policy, let alone an investment into your business. And so if you're interested in having those kind of conversations, please talk to your Red, your red 8 uh, person that you deal with, whether it's an engineer or a salesperson, because they can give you wonderful insight into ways that maybe we can get more out of an investment you're already making, but then turn it into something that makes you better at what you do. Am I that far ahead of time? I'm not even at 20 minutes? Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Well done. Thank you. So, uh, so that said, I will open it up to questions. Um, because there are a lot of misperceptions in terms of what Convault brings to the place, and a lot of that's our own fault. Because uh, again, when we talk about one repository, when we talk about backup, um, 
that we certainly do that. And uh, what people don't realize, though, is that once we collect it that one time and create that one repository, like your iPhone, we can tack on apps on top of that to mine it in different and meaningful ways. So does anybody have any questions in terms of what Commvault does or what people matter or how people have leveraged us, like my friend in Denver, to make more sense out of their information? Who has questions for David? Right. Yes, please. Oh. So you mentioned a little bit about how people are leveraging Commvault to help them make more sense out of their data. Yes. Can you expand a little bit on that for us? Because I do think, as, as, a, as a whole, we're typically thinking about Commvault as a backup utility yep. and not a data mining tool to help, or help us data, to support data mining. Absolutely, absolutely. So again, when you go through a data protection process, a backup process, the wonderful thing about backup that's kind of unique to the IT industry is you start with massive scale. Right? It's highly resilient. We're, we were talking about managing petabytes long before anybody had a production petabyte load because we don't keep one copy of it. We keep seven copies. We keep 100 copies. So we were always very good at managing a scale, even when we came out 15, well, almost 20 years ago now. So the question then became, well, now that we have all this information and we have this wonderful index that tells us not only what the data is but what it contains, well, what information would you be interested in? So a, a couple of use cases to point out. First of all, e-discovery. I know nobody in this room ever gets sued, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but what, when people go through an e-discovery process, there's a couple of things that have to happen. Either they lock all their data down and ship it all to a law firm who charges by the gig to call through it and find out if there's any risk. You know, or they have uh, robust yet very expensive tools that look at very specific slivers of the data, maybe just email or just a specific set of files. But one interesting thing that's happened after I've collected the data is I have all of it. I've got your database data, I've got your SharePoint data, I've got your email data, I've got your file data. Wouldn't it be great if the lawyers had a Google-like search interface where they could do searches and do a single query against all the data at one time? And then not put a legal hold on all of your backups or all of your tapes, but being able, actually being able to select specific files and put a lock and legal hold on just them, or even better, maybe move it to a quarantine, depending on what your, what your lawyer, internal uh, lawyer team says you have to do. The other side of it is beyond an e-discovery discov e perspective is one thing that happens when we back up all the servers in an environment is we collect all the logs. Um, and there are fantastic companies like Splunk uh, that provide insight into what's happening with the server, where the issues are, uh, the trick with Splunk is, though, it's only looking at what's on the server or what's in its logs, which is very short. What if you had a year's worth of logs? You could actually identify when that rogue piece of code hit the server and really have a picture of when things happened, who inserted it, what changed. And since we already have that information and we provide an API to mine that information, well, now all of a sudden, we're taking a process we were using simply as an insurance policy, and now we're trying to, or we're really getting to the point where we can be far more risk avoidant because we're going to find things and be much more historical about it moving forward. Great question. So they, those are two other use cases. I have another one back here. David, give me a second to get to this gentleman. I do play stump the chump, so if we want to get technical, we can do that too. But I'm going to have to call a smart guy if we get too deep. Oh, it's on that side, sorry. Can you speak to the difference uh, with Commvault of backup recovery versus archival recovery and how that may or may not play into that risk conversation you were just discussing? That's fantastic. So, I mean, let's, let's talk through it. What's the difference between a backup and an archive? I mean, for some people, they're the same thing. Right, I'll answer my own question. I, they talk about holding on to backups for a long time, and they call them an archive. When I, when I say archive, I generally think about finding data on in a data repository, whether it's email or SharePoint or a file system, that somebody hasn't touched in oh, years, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, I, I don't, it, on average, we have tools that assess this. If I run uh, a data analytics tool against your file server, a bag of donuts says that 80% hasn't been touched in a year. Well, then I have to start scratching my head and saying, well, 
every three to five years, you have to replace that array. And if 80% of that data hasn't been touched in a year, well, why would I buy such a big array? Or probably more importantly, why not buy the same size array, but buy 80% of cheap and deep storage, highly reliable, cheap and deep storage, and really spend the bucks on a much more expensive top end so that the data that's hot in my environment gets ridiculous throughput. Same budget, same size array, but now I'm making much smarter decisions. And so through an archiving process, maybe we move it to cloud, maybe we move it to tape, maybe we move it to other disk. And that is, um, we have a fantastic relationship with Microsoft. Um, and one of the things that we do for them is when they go and try and sell Azure storage to you, the question is, well, what am I going to use this for? Well, wouldn't it be great to find a big old file system and identify data that hasn't been touched in one, two, five years and just push it up to Azure? Because now, all of a sudden, I've got data in a highly resilient, redundant space, but and I'm at tape level costs of the data, and it's available anytime from anywhere on the planet. I could argue that that 80% actually has better access to my local because I can access it in China just as easily as I can from North America. And a lot of times, of course, Microsoft and, and, and Amazon and their race to zero in terms of storage costs, well, that's a fantastic leverage of that technology. And it makes me, and I did it in a very smart way. So the difference between backup and archive Archive is that data that we probably shouldn't be spending top dollar on. And whether I put shortcuts in the place of it when I move it to the other place, or maybe I take it away and I provide a Google interface so you can look at it uh, through a Google interface rather than shortcutting back to the original system. But in, in the Convo world, it's one repository. The first time I back up that file, I never have to move it again. Archiving it just changes how you access it moving forward. We have a zero footprint archive. So once I back it up, I don't have to move it again to a separate archive unless that's what you want. So it's another opportunity to make that one content store, that one footprint, much more efficient, of course, which is fully deduplicated, fully replicated to commodity storage that you refresh at a, a tenth cost of dedupe appliances and other technologies like that. Uh, and I can move it anywhere. If, if tomorrow Amazon's giving me a better deal than Microsoft, I can move it in the background and your end user experience never changes. But that's when we talk about archive. Archive in my world isn't a different tool. It's just a different retention policy and a different access. Great question, though. Please. Do you have any uh, thoughts of long-term archive, like 20 years? Long-term archive, 20 to 50 years. Technology changes in that. Oh, man. Yeah, don't do it. Throw it away. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And that, that, that's half a joke, half, half of it's not, right? Maybe we should look at our data and decide whether we should keep it because it's probably more risky to keep than not. But in the, in the healthcare space, in the construction space, we do get a lot of 40 to 50 year requests. And you know what? My crystal ball in IT is good for about three years. And I think I'm, I'm boasting when I say three years, right? So what is the technology of choice 50 years from now? And that's why the mobility angle is really important. If you decide, so today you deploy your, your Commvault solution in your archive, right, is going to disk, or let's just say tape. You say, you know what, I want to get rid of the tape library. I'm out of the tape business. I want to go into a highly available but lower cost disk. Well, you tell Commvault, we'll move it over here. And we'll move it over in the background. And then you, the, the access will not change. The recovery points won't change. We just move the back end and update the pointers in our world. And then we want to go to the cloud. Do that. And if you want to go to Star Trek Crystals, because that's what it is 15 years from now, just move the data. If the operating system who wrote the data is happy with that target, whatever that is, 5, 10, 15 years from now, so are we. And so the question isn't, how do I pick a medium that's good for 50 years? The question is, how do I leverage a tool that can move the data to the media that makes the most business sense when it's time to reevaluate? And again, as I know more about the data, I can make smarter and smarter decisions because I bet the way things kind of run, right? The cloud technology is going to stratify just like storage technology did. And there's going to be more expensive cloud storage and less expensive cloud storage. So wouldn't it be great if you had a tool that could stratify it based on age, who created it, who owned it, whether it had pumpernickel somewhere in the content of it. That's why I want, that's the, those are the terms I want to redirect it around to. But that's a fantastic question. It's something we've had to deal with ever since we had a new version of LTO every two years, right? We had to figure out a way to move from one medium to another dynamically without changing the experience. Well, developing that mechanism 
certainly helps now that you know, the different cloud providers and storage providers are providing so much value at more and more aggressive pricing all the time. Now's the time where I don't want to be tied to a technology for five to seven years. I want to make an 18th month, I want to make an 18 month decision. And if you have the right tools, you can make the right investment, well now you can capitalize on that. I have That's another question back here, David. I actually have two, I'll go here and then here. Okay. Uh, something I've personally had to deal with uh, in the past decade, and I know that every one of our customers is dealing with the same oh, thing. Oh, you're a newcomer to IT, got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, is compliance. Oh yeah. Um, and dealing with not only being able to find the data that the, whoever it is, HIPAA or uh, SOX or whatever <laughs> is looking for. I hate those HIPAA for, things, man. Yeah, and, and be able to find it and prove it, but also be able to manage it so you know where every piece of this backup, every copy of this yep. data is, wherever it is, whether it's on the cloud, whether it's internal, whether it's on backup tape, whatever. How does Commvault help us do that? And, and I, not to go back to the slide, because it's kind of a boring slide, but that's why indexing is right in the middle, right? As we ingest, we collect a lot more indexing information than the standard solution, and then when I put it somewhere, I tag it as being there. So that when you say, hey look, I need all the copies of blackbird.xls, regardless of whether it's on tape, or disk, or cloud, or how about this, on production storage in a snapshot, because we can index snapshots, one of the, our industry exclusives. Um, I can tell you where all those copies are. And maybe your legal term, maybe your legal team just wants to get rid of all that and you can surgically delete all of that on the fly. Or maybe you want to coalesce it. Or maybe you just want to have all the different copies uh, put into an XML or some other exportable format to give off the third party counsel. But all those are options inside of our software. But it's all about indexing. You know, if, somebody, if anybody asks me what Commvault's key technology is, I'm going to say it's indexing. Because I can't do anything smart until I know the, the, the parameters of what I'm dealing with until I understand what the data is all about. And to your point, there's all sorts of backup copies on Trevan tapes and cassette tapes and optical platters out there and nobody can throw them away because they don't, they don't even have the machines that can read them anymore, let alone an index to tell them what's on there. Or how about just a laptop? You know what, if I chuck my laptop into, in, into the ocean over here, I, my legal team's gonna, they, we don't even know, they normally wouldn't even know what they lost. Right, the question isn't, oh my gosh, we lost all of David Langley's information, which is worth about a nickel and a cup of coffee. But I don't know, right? And this, this happened to a Commvault employee. He was on his way to a QBR in uh, Tinton Falls, New Jersey. They stopped at a Denny's. Somebody smashed a window and, and walked off with his laptop. What was really fascinating is, obviously, uh, we drank our own champagne. And he had all of his data immediately available at the QBR. He just had one, he logged into his account with one of his buddies and downloaded it through a web interface. But then legal also knew what was also on that laptop and were able to remotely wipe the machine and turn on the camera to identify a great looking picture of the person and pass it off to the police in New Jersey. <laughs> That's kind of cool. And you know what, all that stuff was in one repository in Tinton Falls along with all the other corporate backups and the 18 other copies of that present point, presentation that he was sending out was in all one deduplicated copy in Tinton Falls at our headquarters. So I'm with you. It's not even about how long do I hold the data. That's really not the conversation. We can hold on to data forever, right? That's not hard. Anybody can do that. The question is how do I get it back or how do I even find it or know what I have? And that's something that we absolutely excel at. But that's a great question. Okay, can I give you another one back over here, David? Sure. Great. I don't have anything to do. Yeah, a lot of our customers are moving these days away from tape and yeah. they're sending their backups to cloud. So part of this is to, I mean, you guys made it very easy. You just find the target and you replicate to that target, but then I need to also select a backup provider. Um, are there any factors that we need to consider when choosing one backup provider, cloud provider versus the other? Or in other words, are you guys forming any alliances with any of these cloud providers that could further enhance the value of that data? We've got alliances with all the major cloud providers, uh, and that's a pretty bold statement, I, with, with all the household name cloud providers, uh, mostly because we make it really easy to put data into the cloud, so it's in their best interest to make sure that everything's very simple. I mean, between the S3 and the REST interfaces, there aren't that many interfaces out there. Uh, so from a cloud provider perspective, what do you need to know isn't necessarily whether Commvault can or can't work with them. Um, it's what does it cost not just to storage, store it, but how much does it cost to get there, because some of them charge to push it out. Most people put it up for free, not all. And then what does it cost to get the data back? And probably more importantly, do you know how many restores or recalls of that information 
do you make a month when you do that cost calculation? And does the solution, if you're not a Convo user, does it put the index up with the data and access it so that you actually get charged for the chatter between the repository or not? We've given a lot of thought into how we write data into the cloud. And we put the data in, the index is up there, but when you do a lookup and your search for your data, the, the request actually happens locally, so you're not charged for the chatter up to the cloud. So there's a lot of great questions, and you know, frankly, I think the Red 8 guys are probably better at this than I do in terms of determining where all the costs are gonna come from. Um, but I will, I will make one note there. I don't see a lot of people backing up to the cloud because it's generally a very IO intensive operation. There's a lot of costs there. It's happening, don't get me wrong, but not that much. What I am seeing is a lot of people archiving and a lot of people migrating uh, workloads up to the cloud. Um, and that translation service about taking a physical workload or a virtual workload and putting and making an Amazon workload or an Azure workload, those on the fly translation services are things that we do very well as well, where we can do the translation from physical to virtual to Amazon to Azure in an automated way. So we can do those migrations on the fly. Because a lot of people are looking at doing DR in the cloud or testing DR in the cloud. So they'll back up all their local stuff, but then they'll do their test in the cloud. So that's something that we've been doing quite a bit with our customer base. That's a great question. There's a lot of factors. Please engage your Red A folks. They're very, very good at this conversation. They understand when all the dollar signs show up better than I ever or hope to. All right. I think we're good. Thank you. You've been great.